born in Excel on the 6th of November 1956, Mark de True was the oldest of five children. His parents were teachers and at one point emigrated to the Belgian Congo where they taught. But when the crisis erupted in that country, they brought Dutroux back to Belgium in 1960. His parents eventually separated in 1971 and 15-year-old Dutroux stayed with his mother. We know that his mother was incredibly dominant, his father was very aggressive. So I think it was quite a hostile environment to, to grow up in. And I think those attachments or lack of attachments with his parents in those early years did play quite a, a role in, in the person he became. Trained as an electrician but often unemployed, Dutroux soon began a long criminal history, including convictions for car theft, mugging and drug dealing. Dutroux had a lot of contact with the police. He stepped up from car theft into a rather grand form of car theft, which involved shipping quite expensive luxury cars, which he'd stolen in Belgium, out of the country into Czechoslovakia and Hungary. The profit from his crimes led to Dutroux owning seven properties in and around the city of Charlois, 45 miles south of Brussels. By 1983, 26-year-old Dutroux was married with two children, but he'd begun an affair with a schoolteacher called Michel Martin. The 23-year-old would eventually become Dutroux's partner in life and crime, with whom he also had three more children. The severity of Dutroux's crimes escalated from theft to sexual assault, and in 1989, he was found guilty of the abduction and rape of five young girls, one of whom was just 11 years old. Mark Dutroux was a predator who selected his prey very carefully. He wanted to choose people who were easy to, to target in the first place, easy to abduct, but also easy to manipulate once he had them under his control. So he would go for the most vulnerable victims that, that he could find that fulfilled his desires. Dutroux's now wife, Michelle, was found to be complicit in the abductions and served two years of a five-year sentence. The psychiatrists suggest that Martine and Dutroux, husband and wife, are a classic example of folie à deux, that one egged the other on, and that therefore the sum of the two of them was even more dangerous than one alone. I think when we look at the relationship between Dutroux and his wife, who was implicated in, in many of his crimes, it is quite interesting. Um, it, it's quite possible that, that, that some people see her as, as just another one of his victims, somebody else who was manipulated and, and coerced by him. Um, and when we look at Mark Dutroux and his behaviour, he is incredibly charming at times and he can be very persuasive. Um, so it, it wouldn't surprise me if he'd set out with the intention of recruiting somebody to, to help him in his crimes. And this is somebody who, who fell for his charms and, and went along with it. In December 1995, Dutroux was arrested in relation to a car theft. He was convicted and served almost four months in prison. During this time, the police searched his Marcinelle home. They were agonizingly close to finding out Dutroux's darkest secret. Twice in December 1995, on the 13th and the 19th, police searched the house in Charlois. One of the most poignant and tragic parts of that search, which included a search of the basement, was that the police failed to identify the dungeon. Even more horrifying, the two policemen who searched the house were accompanied by a locksmith who would help them. The locksmith told the policeman that he heard screams. The policeman said, oh, it must be from outside, and disregarded him. The terrible truth is that it was from the two eight-year-olds hidden in this cell, this dungeon. 
After True's house, officers had also found several VHS cassette tapes, but investigators didn't watch them until much later. There was a video, a home video made by Mark Dutroux, um, where he was filming the developments in the works in his, his child cage. This was, was essential proof that they were on the, on, on, the, on the right track. But for some, some strange reason, they did this house search and they didn't exploit the, the information they got from it. The police mistakes came at a fatal cost. By the time Dutroux arrived back home after his release from prison in March 1996, Julie Lejeune and Melissa Russo were dead. Dutroux, his wife Michelle Martin, and an accomplice, Michelle Lalievre, were taken in for questioning. Over several hours of interrogations, all three maintained their innocence. He was consistent in his lies, following each lie by telling another lie. It was a manipulative behavior. But otherwise, he stayed very, very calm. Belgian authorities had no choice but to eventually release Lalievre, who denied being with Dutroux on the day Letitia was kidnapped. But moments after he left the police station in Charlois, a startling witness account came through. Les voisins de la maison de the neighbours of his property in Marcenay saw Marc Dutroux and Lilève return on Friday evening carrying a child covered by a blanket as they returned to his house, to Dutroux's house. Lelièvre was immediately re-arrested and taken back into custody. As his accomplice's alibi began to crumble, Dutroux's interrogation took a drastic turn. Dutroux knows that we had proof that Letitia was in the car, so he says, yes, I was in Batrice, which he denied at the start. I met a young girl, I talked with her, and then she told me she was tired of her parents. Stories, because there are parts against him and he changes the stories to suit his narrative on the spot. Then, at the same time, Lilev said she was with the true, and finally on Thursday, he ends up telling us, now that all of these parts of the story contradict each other, I will give you the two girls. Dutroux pointed to a poster inside the interrogation room of another missing girl, Sabine Dardenne. Twelve-year-old Sabine had been kidnapped by him in May. Two days after his arrest, Dutroux confessed and took the police to the basement where Sabine and Letitia were found alive. On the 15th of August, 1996, Dutroux led the investigators to his property in Marcinelle, where hidden behind a false wall in the basement was the dungeon where he'd been keeping Sabine Dardenne and Letitia Del Hay locked up. He pulled down the wardrobe and inside the cage behind was Sabine and Letitia. And then we got this, yeah, at that, that moment incredible news that two kidnapped girls had been found alive in the cage of a, a person who had been convicted before for this kind of crimes. It was such a huge thing. All the journalists were on the scene at the time. The news, magazines were there. It is as if there had been a terrorist attack. No one could believe that such a person could exist in Belgium. It was unthinkable. Douglas de Conning was one of the few journalists who was allowed to enter de True's basement. We had seen pictures, we had been seen images, but being there is, is uh, difficult to describe because it's 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 like constructed to to you wouldn't even put a dock in uh, such a small place. This was really the, the the kind of cage they made to 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 hide guns from the police. As Belgium awoke in shock to the news that a man from Marcinelle had abducted, raped and tortured two girls over several months, the families of Sabine Dardenne and Letitia Del Hay rejoiced that their daughters had been found alive. 
There are rare occasions when we find the relatives and a policeman or a magistrate has the opportunity to return a child who have been kidnapped in such circumstances alive. It's fantastic, obviously. It is a joy that can be shared with the parents. Over the next 48 hours, investigators continued to relentlessly question De True. They were desperate to find the two eight-year-old girls, Julie Lejeune and Melissa Russo, who'd been missing for more than a year. Well, De True was playing a game with his investigators. He knew that uh, he, he never would get out of prison anymore. He knew that he would be presented as uh, the most famous criminal we've ever had in Belgium and he wanted to exploit that situation. He had to be flattered. They had to make him believe that they believed his pitiful story, make him believe that things were not that bad for him. It's true that you were ingenious on this one. You were not caught and you fooled the police and here and there. At that point, his ego, his ego had been flattered and little by little he let information slip. That's his attitude. After 48 hours of this cat and mouse game, Mark Dutroux finally revealed to investigators that he had abducted the two eight-year-old girls. 